spend more. Yeah. If I am a million, I'd spend more. Morning, everybody, then. Let's make a start on the session. It's very useful to have the slides up in front of you when we go through. So you can see exactly what's missing on here, and we've got to do a little bit of exploration as well in there. One or two of the areas we're going to look at. This week, then, we've got a title called Social Networks, and we're going to look at various issues surrounding that and investigate some of my little pet hobby horses in terms of research and things. And Richard, hopefully, as well, will be along to talk about his, some of the things he's doing as well in sort of this kind of area. So, we tend to Oh, lots of those are missing, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. So, there's some missing off the top here. Just have a look at the whole lot. So we have a list of, of names. Network analysis, social network, social network analysis, social networking, social media, social network services. So what's a social network then? What's your understanding of what a social network is? What's a social network? Connected group of people. Connected group of people, okay. Any other? Give them a name. A network of social networks. A network of social networks. <laughs> what about Facebook? What's that? Um, social network. Is Facebook a social network? Yep. Should be. Probably. It should be. I think it's more than media. When you talk about social networks, we tend to think about computer-based products. Facebook. Um, I think it's social those. media. Yes, social media is probably a better term for it. Yes, and and social network services as well. They are better, really better, better terms. The term social network has got a particularly particular academic research research meaning, in, and it came up through the social sciences. So we're actually, if we talk about social networks in terms of Facebook, we really should be using the term social media or social network services because social network has got a particular meaning from pre-internet, pre pre-web research in social, si social sciences. Um, and their definition is a specific, this is 1982, the book, um, network analysis here, I have the book in front of me. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it has a specific definition in terms of social, social science research and academic work. A specific type of relation linking a defined set of persons, objects or events. So it could be any kind of relationship, not necessarily a computer-based one, but a physical one. And so in an office environment, for example, with employees working in the workplace, there's going to be different networks involved there, so different social communication. You might have your colleagues in your office as a social network. You might have your um, the hierarchy of the management. So I report to my line manager, they report to the head of the school, they report to the head of the department, they report to vice chancellor here. Or it could be a friendship network for um, as well. So um, are my friends with all my office colleagues? I suppose so. But um, I also have uh, staff friends from the other, some of the departments as well. So within any sort of situation or organisation, there is a different set of networks. We might we call them social networks. And it's not necessarily a computer-based tool. So I think what I'd like to suggest is we try to use the right term for the right things. And, okay, yes, a lot missing on the top again still. If we have a look at a more formal representation, we have the grid up here. This is, a, this is a social network, in effect. We have four people, A, B, C, D, connected via various um, uh, social links, talking to each other, I guess. And we can represent that. We can't see the top of the grid, but you can see it on, on your screens. We can represent the links, links by putting in a one between D and, and uh, C here. So there's a link there, there's a connection there, and then there's a connection between A to B as well, here, and C to A uh, up here. Yeah. So we can define, this is a very simple example of a, of a social network, and we can define the interactions between the different actors, as they're called, in a, in a grid. 
And these, this is a very simple example that we can look at and try and analyze more complex ones like we've got over here with, um, it's an undefined, it's an undi undirected graph where everybody talks to everybody else. Perhaps it's a similar situation to this where you know everybody and you all speak to each other. Or it could be a more formal connection, for example, lending money to, some, to, to various people. So Betsy may have lent money to Bob or and, uh, Biff is that, okay? Biff has meant, meant money to Betty, but not to, but not to somebody else. So there's a whole academic theory about what a social network is, and it's slightly different to what we to what we understand the term to be, as we use in everyday life, in terms of computing. And there is a there's a link there to, as you know, Nick Bessis used to run this module, and he's left now. So me and Richard have taken over. And there's a link here to his, okay, you need to put your, uh, oh, probably a good idea if I did sign in actually. I might need to use that later. So I'm gonna sign in, it's probably a good idea to do it. We'll need it later on. Okay, let's try again. Passwords do I have to put in? I think if you actually come out the PowerPoint and right click yeah. the link and go open it, I think it will. Yeah, so I should be able to do it. Let's just try one more time. I didn't tell him about the spelling mistake. So there is a, a le whole lecture on, on this formal definition of what a, a social network is and you can see there's a whole lot of mathematical symbols and terms in there, which I'm not going to go through, but the, this, the um, diagrams are from there, so there's a lot more detail about that in there. And then the other, the other link here is, um, is a paper that gives a example of how this theoretical aspect of social networks is used in an analysis of uh, academic life in terms of referencing papers and collaboration between different academics over different universities. So there's places to go for to look at this more academic, detailed, formal description of what a social network is. But we're not going to go into detail in this class, but do look at that outside of here. But what I'd like to move on to is an influential a woman this time, which is nice to have instead of all the males we've been looking at the last few weeks. Something called Jennifer Goldbeck. And she is director of the Human Computer Inter Interaction Lab in University of Maryland. Does that director of the HCI lab in Maryland spark any Memories for you in, from other previous classes I've done with you? The ones I've seen for the last three or four years, two or three years? The open data. Hmm? The open data. Open data. No, um, it wasn't what I was thinking of, maybe, but it wasn't what I was thinking of. No, we were on those. You weren't, were you on the, on the, um, no, we on the University of Maryland? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, you can. Those of you that have seen me for the last couple of years, any? <coughs> ben Schneiderman, hey, Golden Rules, in user interface design. He was. Eye tracking. Yes, eye tracking as well, yes. He was the original founder. Ben Schneiderman was the original founder of the um, Human Computer Interaction Lab in, in MIT, in Maryland, University of Maryland, rather. And he was very influential in getting the whole area of uh, usability established as a proper professional discipline. And she's taken over now, he's probably retired a few years ago, and she is very much interested in 
social media research and science communication, looking at what... Now we're talking about social media now, notice. Okay, we're now using the term social media, which means online computer networks, online social networking. And she's done a lot of research into what, how we can analyze and, and track all that, all those messages and things that are going on through social media to see what kind of conclusions we can draw from it. We'll have a look at the TED video in a minute or two, but, and there's a nice couple of minute interview here with her as well. But if we go into, sorry, Richard. If we go into this link here, what computers know about you from social media, just go into that. And this is some details of her research that she's been looking at. And if we look down here, I don't want to go too far up, there is a, some little tools here. Five Labs, personality from your Facebook post. You are what you like. Analyzing your personality from Facebook likes. So there's some... Let's have a look in here. So you can see there's some work and some products being done to analyse the uh, people's posts and try and draw conclusions from it, um, which can be easily marketing and all, and all that kind of thing. So I suggest you have a look at that when you put you in your when we outside class time. Try that out and see what uh, see what you get from it. Put your Facebook account in and see see what it says or what it thinks it tells you about you and what people can conclusions can draw I'm not going to put my Facebook stuff in but there's also some interesting little tools here as well um, if you want to there's a lot of um, publicity about online security these days and your personal profiles putting too much information on up there on the web identity theft all that kind of thing so you can delete um, Posts, there's a tool here to delete posts from Twitter um, if you don't want to leave them up for employees in two or three years' time to find what you've, things you should have, shouldn't have said. And then there's another one here, Facebook, um, okay. Facebook um, app there to delete your Facebook timeline, some aspects of your Facebook timeline. So have a look at those later on in outside the class and see what was in there. So Jennifer Goldbeck has been doing a lot of research in this area and she's published four books, none of which are in the library yet, but that's on my to-do list to, uh, to get these in there. So this is the kind of thing that we can be looking at in terms of analysing social media that works there. So let's have a look at 10 minute, 10 minute talk from uh, Jennifer Goldbeck on the TED talk. And she also talks about something that Richard mentioned a couple of weeks ago about that 16 year old girl that was. Yeah. As, um, the, uh, the target company. That's the one. Were able to identify uh, before she got around to telling her family that she's pregnant. By using data analytics of um, her pattern of spending and a change in her check pattern of spending um, using presumably either her own loyalty card or yeah. family loyalty card. Well, in the talk, she mentions that uh, particular example as some of the research. Yeah. So, <laughs> let's. Um, are you going to be able to see this with this uh, screen not working very well? Let's see. I might just leave it in this this uh, so we don't. If you remember that first decade of the web, it was really a static place. You could go online, you could look at pages. And they were put up either by organizations who had teams to do it, or by individuals who were really tech savvy for the time. And with the rise of social media and social networks in the early 2000s, the web was completely changed to a place where now the vast majority of content we, near, we interact with is put up by average users, either in YouTube videos or blog posts, 
or product reviews or social media postings. And it's also become a much more interactive place where people are interacting with others, they're commenting, they're sharing, they're not just reading. So Facebook's not the only place you can do this, but it's the biggest and it serves to illustrate the numbers. Facebook has 1.2 billion users per month. So half the Earth's internet population is using Facebook. They're a site, along with others, that's allowed people to create an online persona with very little technical skill. And people responded by putting huge amounts of personal data online. So the result is that we have behavioral, preference, demographic data for hundreds of millions of people which is unprecedented in history. And as a computer scientist, what this means is that I've been able to build models that can predict all sorts of hidden attributes for all of you that you don't even know you're sharing information about. As scientists, we use that to help the way people interact online, but there's less altruistic applications. And there's a problem in that users don't really understand these techniques and how they work, and even if they did, they don't have a lot of control over it. So what I want to talk to you about today is some of these things that we're able to do and then give us some ideas of how we might go forward to move some control back into the hands of users. So this is Target the company. I didn't just put that logo on this poor pregnant woman's belly. You may have seen this anecdote that was printed in Forbes magazine where Target sent a flyer to this 15-year-old girl with advertisements and coupons for baby bottles and diapers and cribs two weeks before she told her parents that she was pregnant. Yeah, the dad was really upset. Uh, so how did Target figure out that this high school girl was pregnant before she told her parents? It turns out that they have the purchase history for hundreds of thousands of customers. And they compute what they call a pregnancy score, which is not just whether or not a woman's pregnant, but what her due date is. And they compute that not by looking at like the obvious things, like she's buying a crib or baby clothes, but things like she bought more vitamins than she normally had or she bought a handbag that's big enough to hold diapers. And by themselves, those purchases don't seem like they might reveal a lot, but it's a, a pattern of behavior that when you take it in the context of thousands of other people, starts to actually reveal some insights. So that's the kind of thing that we do when we're predicting stuff about you on social media. We're looking for little patterns of behavior that when you detect them among millions of people, lets us find out all kinds of things. So in my lab and with colleagues, we've developed mechanisms where we can quite accurately predict things like your political preference, your personality score, gender, sexual orientation, religion, age, intelligence, along with things like how much you trust the people you know and how strong those relationships are. We can do all of this really well. And again, it doesn't come from what you might think of as obvious information. So my favorite example is from this study that was published this year in the Proceedings of the National Academies. If you Google this, you'll find it. It's four pages, easy to read. And they looked at just people's Facebook likes, so just the things you like on Facebook, and used that to predict all these attributes along with some other ones. And in their paper, they listed the five likes that were most indicative of high intelligence. And among those was liking the page for curly fries. Curly fries are delicious. But liking them does not necessarily mean that you're smarter than the average person. So how is it that one of the strongest indicators of your intelligence is liking this page when the content is totally irrelevant to the attribute that's being predicted? And it turns out that we have to look at a whole bunch of underlying theories to see why we're able to do this. One of them is a sociological theory called homophily, which basically says people are friends with people like them. So if you're smart, you tend to be friends with smart people, and if you're young, you tend to be friends with young people. And this is well established for hundreds of years. We also know a lot about how information spreads through networks. It turns out things like viral videos or Facebook likes or other information spreads in exactly the same way that diseases spread through social networks. So this is something we've studied for a long time. We have good models of it. And so you can put those things together and start seeing why things like this happen. So if I were to give you a hypothesis, it would be that a smart guy started this page, or maybe one of the first people who liked it would have scored high on that test. And they liked it, and their friends saw it. And by homophily, we know that he probably had smart friends. And so it spread to them, and some of them liked it. And they had smart friends, and so it spread to them, and so it propagated through the network to kind of a host of smart people so that by the end, the action of liking the curly fries page is indicative of high intelligence, not because of the content 
but because the actual action of liking reflects back the common attributes of other people who have done it. So this is pretty complicated stuff, right? It's a hard thing to sit down and explain to an average user. And even if you do, what can the average user do about it? How do you know that you've liked something that indicates a trait for you that's totally irrelevant to the content of what you've liked? There's a lot of power that users don't have to control how this data is used. And I see that as a real problem going forward. So I think there's a couple paths that we want to look at if we want to give users some control over how this data is used. Because it's not always going to be used for their benefit. An example I often give is that if I ever get bored being a professor, I'm going to go start a company that predicts all of these attributes and things like how well you work in teams and if you're a drug user, if you're an alcoholic, we know how to predict all that. And I'm going to sell reports to HR companies and big businesses that want to hire you. We totally can do that now. I could start that business tomorrow and you would have absolutely no control over me using your data like that. That seems to me to be a problem. So one of the paths we can go down is the policy and law path. And in some respects, I think that that would be most effective, but the problem is we'd actually have to do it. Um, observing our political process in action makes me think it's highly unlikely that we're going to get a bunch of representatives to sit down, learn about this, and then enact sweeping changes to intellectual property law in the U.S. if users control their data. We could go the policy route where social media companies say, you know what, you own your data, you have total control over how it's used. The problem is that the revenue models for most social media companies rely on sharing or exploiting users' data in some way. It's sometimes said of Facebook that the users aren't the customer, they're the product. And so how do you get a company to cede control of their main asset back to the users? It's possible, but I don't think it's something that we're going to see change quickly. So I think the other path that we can go down that's going to be more effective is one of more science. It's doing science that allowed us to develop all these mechanisms for computing this personal data in the first place. And it's actually very similar research that we'd have to do if we want to develop mechanisms that can say to a user, here's the risk of that action you just took. You know, by liking that Facebook page or by sharing this piece of personal information, you've now improved my ability to predict whether or not you're using drugs or whether or not you get along well in the workplace. And that, I think, can affect whether or not people want to share something, keep it private, or just keep it offline altogether. We can also look at things like allowing people to encrypt data that they upload, so it's kind of invisible and worthless to sites like Facebook or third-party services that access it, but that select users who the, the person who posted it want to see it have access to see it. This is all super exciting research from an intellectual perspective. And so scientists are going to be willing to do it. So that gives us an advantage over the law side. Uh, one of the problems that people bring up when I talk about this is they say, you know, if people start keeping all this data private, all those methods that you've been developing to predict their traits are going to fail. And I say, absolutely. And for me, that's success. Because as a scientist, my goal is not to infer information about users. It's to improve the way people interact online. And sometimes that involves inferring things about them. But if users don't want me to use that data, I think they should have the right to do that. I want users to be informed and consenting users of the tools that we develop. And so I think encouraging this kind of science and supporting researchers who want to cede some of that control back to users and away from the social media companies means that going forward, as these tools evolve and advance, means that we're going to have an educated and empowered user base. And I think all of us can agree that that's a pretty ideal way to go forward. Thank you. When everyone has every song ever written, what matters most is how you listen. There we go. I always get caught out by that. What do you think about the, the issue there that she touched on at the end about, on the one hand, Facebook and their I call them social media companies actually want you to put all your secrets online <coughs> so they can sell it and use it for marketing. But on the other hand, the privacy aspects of 
using social media. What's the what do you think about that balance? And in particular, this tweet. This is why this tweet delete tool here is. She, she was saying that we should have a, a control over our privacy issues. So that's why these two tools are there. What do you think about that in particular? How how are you bothered about that when you're using Facebook? I'm very aware of it. You're very aware of it. Yeah. I mean, isn't there a law in the EU, uh, the right to be forgotten, uh, where you can request websites to delete your yeah. old messages? There is, I think, yes. It, yeah, so there is, but, yeah, but it it's not relevant in the uh, It's only in the EU. It's relevant only in the EU, and it is only relevant for particularly old and potentially damaging information which is now no longer relevant. It is not to allow you to just get tweets deleted or your Facebook profile yeah. deleted. It's a very, very specific and very, very targeted um, uh, thing. So, that if, for example, if, if you had a bankruptcy 30, 20 years ago and it's now still damaging your business reputation, then but there's just the two accounts somewhere in the newspaper sort of 20 years ago, then in principle you can ask Google um, <coughs> under certain circumstances to delete the links from the European search engines. Right. But it's not going back to the, ori the original source to get the newspaper to delete it from their website or whatever. Yeah. So you're not worried about putting stuff on, on uh, online then? It should be like given something to read and sign. Do you think, that's, you sign do you think that's practical? I love yeah, but it's fine print, isn't it? I love my Twitter down, so people shouldn't go to farm stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, you don't know. You, this is a point we don't know, do we? And uh, what's that? Um, Stout Soudan? Soudan? What's his name? Snowden. 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 Yeah. Snowden. The... Um, the uh, Consultant for, for the uh, CIA, was it? NSA. Yeah, and he's he's shown exactly what goes on in those organisations. And they can get hold of anything, almost. You know? So we just don't know. We'll just um, have a look at some of the research reports, because I think they might be useful to you in some of the, the work you're doing. Say, so she's a um, professor at um, University of Maryland, and she's written, obviously, loads of papers here. Um, try not to keep, I'll try to keep the thing on the screen. So, and some of these things might be interesting. Um, computing applied trust in web-based social no networks. Um, what else is there? Social networks applied. Quite old, yeah. Hmm? Quite old, those papers. 2004, yeah, 2008. I did see one. Uh, predicting personality with social media. <coughs> um, we saw a little bit of a... You, you played with um, Blue Mix the other week with that a little bit as well. Um, trust as well in, in reputation and things like that. So, another useful source of um, information for you. Let's just have a look at her main website as well. And this has given more detail of her talks and things like that and the book she's done. Um, research and CV, I think there might be some more things in there. Okay, it's on the university site. So, it's nice to have, we've talked about influential people, Tim Berners-Lee, Hans Rosling, Stephen Few, in terms of uh, dashboards last week. It's nice to have a woman uh, that is uh, leading the pack there. So there's some um, role models for you, females in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the module. So aspirations for you. Okay. The other thing I found, I was, I don't know if you've come across this kind of stuff in the um, social media second year module. How many of you did, did, did social media? Just one or two, three of you, four of you. Um, I came across this, I was walking around the third floor of our block a couple of days ago and I came across this 2015 social media map. Um, and it's by produced by a advertising agency, All oh, Drive Interactive here, um, based in the States, um, and they've got all sorts of clients and case studies and things for, their, for the work they're doing. 
so very active in uh, this kind of social media, so I'll call it social media, I'm using social media, social media terms. Um, and they <coughs> produce this map here. Uh, and if you go into that link, I suggest you do this actually, just try this yourselves and you'll get a better picture of it. I'm assuming I'm still logged in, no I'm not, okay. In fact I am, no I'm not, alright, here we go. Okay, here we are. And this is quite a fascinating picture of the world of social media. And they've identified all these different social, me social media services, products, and categorized them. And every single one of these is a link to that site, to that service. So if we have a look at, say, and there's a, there's a key down here, websites, mobile apps, tools, and platforms. So they've got the usual ones, eBay, Yelp, but if you go into some of the others, um, let's have a look. Uh, social media listening to, to, to social search. Let's have a look at the photo sharing one, maybe. Have you heard of Mobile? No. No. Uh, it's, it's listed on the final website. <laughs> Photo log, heard of that? No. Let's have a look in there. Oh, it's French. Okay, there we go. Bonjour. Right, okay, I think we'll oh, skip those very good. quickly. Je um, m'appelle Photo. Je suis photo. But you can see it's a, a gold mine of, of um, all the different social media sites and categorize them. Oh, there's some Japanese ones as well. Uh, worldwide stuff here. So have a, have an explore of that in your, in your uh, again, outside class time. Fascinating, fascinating resource, I think. The other thing that I think is interesting, again, as a oh, source of... MySpace is still a thing. Hmm? MySpace is still a thing. Yeah. Also on Wikipedia, there's a list of networking, social networking websites. Did you come across these in the second year module at all? Um, you know, no. Have you seen that map, the social media map before? No. No. Recent and similar. Yeah. But it's it's a you know obviously well designed, well put together, and a very valuable source. And there's also this um, list of um, social media products services on Wikipedia, and I guess all these are, the ones on the map will be listed in here. If we look at the registered users and sort by that, and see how many people are using these, Google Plus is one, how do we say that? 16,000 million, that doesn't sound quite right. 1.6 billion. 1.6 billion. 1 billion, there we go. Google Plus make automatic accounts for all Gmail accounts. Do they? Yeah. So that's, so that's not registered how users. people have actually signed yeah. up. And Facebook here, 1.28 billion. And then Twitter is half of that. Um, so the two, the big, Facebook is still the big player here. Um, but there's still some pretty big ones. If we go down the list. Photo log there, I was just looking at that in the, um, on, from, the social, from the social media map. Friends Reunited as well. Um, so there's far more there than I, I realised uh, existed. So again, another useful place for you to look at. In your research activities. So, having introduced the idea of social media and some of the issues involved in terms of uh, companies mining that information to predict and try and sell you things, <coughs> let's go along to some of the perhaps more negative side of it and some of my and Richard's particular 
interests and hobby horses. Um, we can't see the top there, but it says the curse of email. And because we, because it is now so easy to send messages, it's starting to be a big problem in terms of information overload, in terms of techno stress on uh, the knowledge worker, as we call them. In the past, in the if you would look at the manual system, if you like, the pencil and paper system, the post, good old letter writing, write a letter, put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, put it in the post box. That's been around for quite a long time, 100 years or so, a bit, more, a bit longer than that. In the early days of the post, the cost of the communication was borne by the receiver. So the person receiving the letter had to pay for the delivery of it. And then they switched it around some time ago now to what we're now familiar with in that the sender of the letter, the sender of the communication actually bears the cost of the communication. So the sender of the, with, with a letter, the sender has to write it, which is a two minute job usually. You have to really deliberately <coughs> think about what you're doing. It's a conscious effort to do, to do it, to write the letter, to put it in the pot, to put an envelope. And you pray, the, the sender sends the price the sender pays the price for the for the stamp and then the, the physical activity of putting it in the post box and then the receiver, all the receiver has to do is open up the envelope and read it. So the, the majority of the cost, the biggest cost of the communication, if you like, is with the sender. With email, it's the other way around. The it, Because it's now so easy to send emails, the cost has been transferred from the sender to the receiver. And what's been the consequence of that? You'd like to speculate what's happened. Those of you that work in industry have been on placements. What is the... Are you inundated by mail you don't want? Physical mail letters that you don't want? Physical letters. Sometimes. Yeah. How many do you get? Two or three a day, maybe? Yeah, about Yeah, okay. So what about email then and electronic communication? How much comes through electronic devices? A lot. A lot. Do you manage to process all that information? No. But so what? Open it. Very rarely open it. Yeah. Okay. So this is an interesting dilemma we have. Because we've made communication so easy with email electronic communication, and we've transferred the cost from the sender to the receiver, we are now inundated with communication. Those of you that have been on placement and, and worked in industry, what was the email culture like in your organisations when you were working there? Did you a get nightmare. A nightmare? Yeah. Why is it a nightmare? You had to create so many rules on emails because you got so many, you got spam emails, you got emails from things that you knew weren't weren't important. So you had to almost prioritise what emails you were going to read, otherwise right. you'd be there forever. So you'd spend your whole working life and outside it maintaining your emails. <laughs> okay, what about the others? Sophie, Andy. But how did it affect your working life? Yeah, okay. So basically my little hobby horse, my argument is that whilst these tools are very efficient, we need to use them in a way that makes us more efficient as workers, knowledge workers, rather than just getting away in a minute. What's happened is, in my particular bias, is that we've just we, it's had the opposite effect of decreasing our productivity because of all the information overload. We've got all these different technologies we can use, instant messaging, texts, emails, and we need some way of exploiting that to improve our efficiency rather than actually suffering from information overload. Which brings me on to my next slide, next slide about information overload. And when I was researching this, I came across an interesting set of people, organisation, the Information Overload Group. Ever heard of them? I thought, wow, I, need to be, I think I want to be a member of the Information Overload Group. 
and they are people, academic researchers, dedicated to addressing the problem of information overload, an ongoing crisis that diminishes productivity and quality of life among knowledge workers worldwide. Would you agree that there is a problem with information overload and that it's decreasing our, diminishing our productivity and quality of life? Yes. So why do we do it? Why do we send dozens of emails to everybody? Keep it audit trail of communication backwards and forwards, especially working, go out on yeah. paper. Businesses wouldn't operate without email. There are some, we use email, again, your examples, I guess email was, you needed to keep, email was a very valuable means of communication between you and clients. So on the one hand, it's very valuable, but on the other hand, because of this overload, it's, it's having the opposite effect to what we want. And that's an interesting problem, which is one of my little hobby horses uh, in terms of sort of research and things and, and digging around. Um, Okay, so I think it's time I gave you this document then. One, two, three, four, five. There you go. like to do is just turn to look back. Obviously I'd like to read the whole of it at some point, but uh, I'd like you just to turn to the back and look at from pages starting at, let's have a look, starting at page 22, you go to page 22 and start from what can we do now section and just read through those Two or three or four pages to twenty-six. Oh, sorry, just go to um, just go to twenty-four. Twenty-two to twenty-four. So just just a couple of pages, and then I want to get some reaction from you in terms of whether you feel these strategies may work based on your own experiences and in working life.
Okay, have you been through those couple of pages? Again, going back to your own experiences of working life, there are some suggestions here about how to control information overload. Has your companies that you worked in tried to do something like this and do you think this kind of thing's going to work? Based on your own experiences, and we've sort of seen that it is a problem. What do you think about these? And this this document is from 2007, which is pre iPhone, which is in some ways added to the problems of having always on smartphone access. So things have got even worse, I suggest, since this document was produced. Any? Do you think this kind of stuff will work? And what kind of things did you do in your organisation to try and control it? Our main problem was people copying others in. If you copy others in, it just makes <coughs> one and they often might send it out to 20. It's just built up. Everyone puts so like, Do you really Why? them in the same habit? It's a very common habit to do that. Why do people do it? Why do they copy a dozen do people instead of just, say, one? Well, there's a fine line between information overload and communication. So you want, if you're in a team, for example, you all want to be on the same page. So sometimes people use emails as almost a trail so that people can reference it in the future. There needs to be some kind of audit trail of communication, yes. My argument would be that email isn't that isn't efficient in that respect. Okay. So we have we use an app called Slack, which is a it's basically instant messaging. So if we are communicating within a team and it doesn't need to go on email, we will use Slack. But obviously that is an argument. We are using multiple apps to communicate. Making life more complicated. More complicated. But it's like now I'm getting notifications from, from work at the moment instantly up on my phone screen. So I'm always on the clock, if you will. Yes, and that's not a good place to no. be. Pizza's efficient, after all. Hmm? It, it's an argument between being efficient and being engrossed in the job all the time. Well, it's, again, this is balancing act, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, any of the others? What kind of mechanisms did you have for controlling your processing your emails and reducing this, making communication efficient? Work email uh, links to my own email. So if there's something in my email, I know that it gets linked to my home email so I can look at it, but it wouldn't be opened at work. So I would know that something needs to be done, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't necessarily to make them know that I've looked at it. Because if I looked at it, it's like, well, oh, I haven't even done it yet. Well, I'm busy doing other things. Yeah, I have two, two accounts. <laughs> I have a work email account and a private one, and I don't mix them up. But you still, that's still not overcoming the problem two of just one. too much data and being able to process it because important things get lost inside the mass of, of everything else. Okay Richard, I think on that overload issue, do you want to come and do your yeah. bit about techno stress and things like Why that? Yeah. That would probably feed in nicely to that. Do you techno stress? Yes. Techno stress. Techno stress, yeah. yeah. Did you want to? Is it running? Yeah, it's still running. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you can see the screen is all sticks out. Ah, it sounds like a rave, or like a rave name. Where's, uh, there we are. Come on, uh, I'll just put him up there now. Yeah. Okay, so there's a couple of slides on course resources from Richard. So if you want to bring those up, because you can't see the, the, the screen very well. So is it, it could be in course resources. There's in course resources on there, this, just on gone this week. On this week, week, week eight, yep. Week eight, yeah. Okay, so bring that up. And uh, I've talked about my little hobby horse. Uh, yeah, and Richard's now going to talk about one of his past hobby horses. Area of uh, explanation. No, you need to let the slides for um, Richard. Yeah, it's the bottom. The bottom one in the set. It's called stress When this arrives. Yeah, it's still not there. It's not there. What? Yeah. No, just reload. Technostress. No, that's a reload page. 
set you off on, I'll brief you on all the exercises, research exercises for the rest of the morning and then get a break at that point and then we'll you can work on this stuff later. And see what you found later on in the morning. <laughs> How many tetanus stress? You have given me tetanus stress. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying this. How am I giving you tetanus stress? You keep saying it. Okay, folks. Almost stress by giving you tetanus stress. Oh, kind of feels like it. Yeah, it kind of flows on from that last thing. Yeah, it does. 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 Yeah, yeah, we can set up the filters to stuff lots and lots of the email into junk mail or into different folders for different tasks and so on. And yet we still get a huge amount in our, left in our in basket. And then I know that I tend to f miss many requests for references that uh, some of you guys send in, because, and they kind of get I oh, can't can't quite answer it just now. I'm just too busy, and then it all goes down, down, down the page, and eventually. Kind of forget until you get the next reminder, which is in case it's in that. Oops! And you get, you know, feel, you feel bad that you haven't actually helped support someone who needs a little bit of help with getting a good job or something like that. And there's all sorts of things going on. And we, I've got st students doing research on this thing, techno stress uh, and social media, among other things, smart devices, etc., etc. And I started. Uh, back in 2010-2011 uh, when I had a student, a master's student, who was do doing an online program here uh, who worked in the Ministry of something or other in Malta. And Malta's an interesting country because it's very small, just two significant islands, the big one and then the little one goes off at the top northwest. And he was uh, I, one of the IT managers there. And Malta is one of the most heavily e-government programmed com country in the world. They've got more uh, technology, e-technology supporting the government processes than almost any other com country had back then. And he was kind of interesting. He tripped over a book by Doug Rose and Michelle Wheel um, back in, who they, what they wrote back in what, about 1999, 1998, sometime around then, on this thing called Technostress. And he thought, hey, this is rather interesting because he had noticed that although so many functions were being provided uh, by the Maltese government, 
he, did, he got a strong feeling that his co-workers in the ministries really didn't like all of that E being delivered. It didn't work anyway. We know them. But such a huge proportion of the electronic systems don't work very well. You know, you just have to read the Standish Group reports and see how in unsuccessful we are in delivering successful IT-related projects. And the problem is not the, the 30, 25-30% that fail, because they don't actually have much impact on the workers uh, in many respects. It's the ones that challenge, the ones that deliver about 40% of the functionality that's required Remembering that the, fourth, the functionality that was actually signed up for in the contract is only 20% of what they were actually used to using, although the other 80% they'd use you know, once or twice a year perhaps, it still met a need for the customers. And suddenly you strip back to 20% that delivers 80% of the workload, and now you've got a project which is challenged and only delivers 40% of that 20%, you've only got 8% of the functionality that you th were using before the system came in, even if infrequently. And so he did his study, he, he did a survey across about 150 or so of the staff that worked in his ministry, and using the calibrated, validated questionnaire that Rosenweil had used back in the late 80s, and that one or two people had used between then and his project in 2010. And he discovered that the levels had risen. And then in 2012, 13, and 13, 14, I got students, you know, just like you guys, find their students to do work on this, um, this topic. You can see all, well, if you look on your screens, you'll see the top two bullet points give you some links to where there's a whole lot of uh, stuff I've uh, produced or published on the um, web page here at Derby. And also you can see this is where uh, undergraduate dissertations for computing get published. And you can see, and you search through the list on that, that one there, and you'll find about four or five uh, dissertations, all about technostress. stress. The first year, in 20, published in 2013, they were all about just characterizing that had the levels of stress changed, compared to the original reports back in 1995, 1997, 1998. <coughs> Whereas a 2014 set um, were doing the diagnostics, trying to find out what actually was driving this increase in tetanus stress. The results actually were really quite interesting, and you can't see the top bit as we keep apologizing for, but you'll see it on the slide there that you've got. And you'll see just how enormously high uh, something on uh, the Pusey report was about 100, just over 120, 130, I think, um, respondents. 95, 99% of the respondents showed some degree of stress in, caused by all of this technology. And the one below that by... Um, I forget what her name was, uh, Roulette, uh, what was it? Yeah, Roulette. She did that one in a, the, a, the hosp a hospital still relatively close to us. Oh no, that was Malotsworth, the one down at the 70%. Um, she did about 250 at a, one of our local hospitals. And that showed about 70% were stressed by the technology. For the, um, yeah, for the 2014 set, the overall, if I summed up all about 600, 700 respondents, we had 85% stress level. And so it's kind of showing lots of things are going on. What we got became very, very interesting with the 2014-15 set, the last column over here, and we had much, much greater spread of results. Those are the ones which are trying to identify, was it the 24-7 levels of access or, or what, what, what was going on? To cut a long story short, we didn't really find out any conclusive evidence that linked the rise of techno stress to any particular type of cause. And if we look at the next slide, we were looking at things like 
Is it the fact that it's 24-7? The fact that people leave these things on all night without putting them into go to sleep mode, to make them quiet between, say, the hours of 10 o'clock and 6 o'clock or 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, people get up in the middle of the night to go to the loo, and the first thing they do is, rather than go to the loo, they pick up their phone and look, oh, any more message here? And then when they get back from the loo, just before they get back into bed and switch the light out, another quick check, just in case something had happened. Was it the fact that when you're at home, if you go back 20, 30 years, you'd be sitting around the TV as a family and watching it all together and you'd be commenting about it, you'd be able to turn it on. But today, everybody's so, what, half an eye on the TV and they go mm, like that and they're reading social network, they're looking at their emails, they're sending emails, they're slacking each other or, or whatever. The addiction to this constant connectivity? Is it the fact that we don't talk to people any longer? We send emails to a colleague in the desk next to us because we want that back, uh, back side padding email trail. I know of, a colle of colleagues in different jobs I've had who very carefully ensure that they have an archive of every single email they've ever sent about particular things just in case so they can show Yet yeah, you said that, and, but you never did it. And they carefully build these archives which are used as evidence later on. There's the addiction, the fact that you know, we get out of the house, get into the car, drive half a mile, and oh, I haven't got my phone, I've got to go back round. And you drive round and go and get the phone. Does it really matter if we don't have our mobile phone for a day and it rings quietly in the home? Wow, isn't that nice? Peace and quiet. You go out to a pub, you go to a restaurant, and what do you see? People sitting around a table and every single person has their mobile phone out there on the desk, on the table, next to them, just so they can, they might miss something. Hmm? You've all got your phones out! Well, not quite everybody, but almost all of you have. What is it that's really going on that's caused this, this total addiction? You know, as I said, you, know, you go out of the house without it and you feel withdrawal symptoms, I'm not safe without it. The car might break down and I can't call the AA. Perhaps. But then again, at the same time, you think, oh no, not again. Another loud bing goes off. I'll put it under quiet now. I want some peace and quiet. I really don't want to be irritated. I don't want to be... How many of you ever actually do that because you just got fed up with these emails and SMSs coming in going ding, ding, ding? And yet, no, I want some peace and quiet. I'll switch it off, switch it quiet, and ignore it for the next hour or two. And how do you feel at the end of that? Twitchy or peaceful? Well, hmm? Yeah, what's going on? <laughs> and yeah, and then again, another aspect is the constant change. I mean, on here, I haven't updated it. It's supposed to be updated from an iOS 8.3, I think. Should have gone to 4.4, 4, but it didn't. It went to, then it went to 9.0, and I didn't bother because I knew that there'd be something coming out quickly, so I waited till 9.0.1, and then 9.0.2, and 9.0.3. Oh, it's now 9.1 now. I think. Well, I might do that. I'll have to par plug it in overnight get it to do the update, because it takes half a battery to do an update, and then bother, I'm going to have to re-enter credentials for a variety of things, because the iOS update doesn't work terribly well at times, and it wipes out passwords here, there, and everywhere if you're not careful, or oh, loses track of them. Uh, hang on, and then you look at the App Store, and a number of updates, I think I've got 40 on here waiting for the moment, for ev almost every single item on here and needs an update. Where is it? 
Fortunately, it doesn't tell me how many I've got waiting. Oh, it says I've got 21 waiting. My iPad's got 40 odd waiting. Why do I need an update every two weeks or three weeks for an app? Because someone's incompetent out there. They've done an update to the app and it's broken something else, or they've found another thing they've been careless about when they wrote the app originally and they had left a security hole or something, and they keep this perpetual beta. We are not customers of finished products. Almost all software today, whether it's mainframe or sort of PC stuff or apps on smart devices, is permanent beta. Got to get it out quickly. Oh, yeah, and if it breaks, well, we'll do an update in a little bit. And if we break it a bit, something else, we'll fix that in a bit. And we kind of, really? Or, you know, if you go back two, three years, four years, you know, I want a replacement for my, might have been a Nokia 6300. Uh, we stopped making those two years ago. What, you mean just after I got the contract? Yep. What can I have now? Well, you can have a Nokia C3. But I wanted the 6300. Sorry, mate. So these devices change every year. You know, iPhones, 5C, you've got that, came out new last year. I'll, you might be able to get it next in 12, 12 months' time. I'm not going to bet on it. You've got to have the 6C or 6S. But that's top, top one and a half times the size. I don't want a big one. Look at the difference. Can I just borrow yours? Yeah. Look at the difference in size. That one fits my pocket, pocket up there beautifully. This one, just. And I've got one shirt where my six, uh, Nokia 6300 went in beautifully, and this one kind of just about. The death of these um, Nokia Symbian. That was a lovely, if you wanted a simple phone that just did what it said on the label, it was a phone and sent texts, the Nokia, um, the older Nokias were absolutely great. And then they killed it, killed Symbian and took on the Windows, op, uh, Windows Mobile. Can't stand that, it's impossible to use. Don't understand it, don't want to understand it. I like this one. And I won't have, well, if I replace it this year, I can probably get a new one. I do it, wait till next year. I'll have to go for the bigger one, which might be nicer in one way. It's a bit closer to an iPad size. But then the manufacturers provide different interfaces so that apps that work on here, I mean, for example, there's a British Airways app that you can get for if you're flying. And you can get it for that, but it doesn't come, and the BA Exec Club one does not come for an iPad. <gasps> Why not? Why do those manufacturers not do something sensible and just make it scale itself using, what was the technology, the scalable web pages? Response. Responsive web design. Why don't they do that? It'd be so much simpler for them. Wouldn't irritate us. IT often doesn't work terribly well. Well, it works when we don't need it to work particularly urgently. Now, if you're doing it, buying something on the net, and you, on a PC, say, for the sake of arguing, because that's why I tend to do it, because I tend not to use, buy things off here, on the PC, and then you put your credit card details in, or debit card details in, and it goes off to do the check to authorise it. Now, when it's not critical that it works, it's going to work, just the way things are. But you've got to do something, you know, 2 o'clock at night or 1 o'clock at night and you've absolutely got to make that transaction in the next hour and a half. Because it's critically urgent, it is almost a lot certainly going to say, oh dear, we can't validate your credit card today. Talk to your credit card issuer tomorrow morning. Then tomorrow morning, when it's now three hours, four hours too late, really, but you still want it, you do it and oh, perfect, no trouble at all. The probability of IT breaking is almost directly proportional to the importance of that particular transaction. And I learned this back in the 1980s when I wanted to, had to do a presentation to my director. 
the group director about something, and I and my colleagues, uh, who were, uh, guy who worked for me, who had a lot of experience with IT, we thought, I think we better have some printouts of the slides. So we printed out the slides, and as Jim walks in, the director, oh dear, TSO's died, mainframe collapsed. Fortunately, we got the, pres the presentation pack and paper. And it's all of these sort of things that seem to be the problem, but it's not, but we can't prove it at the moment. What we couldn't prove last year, or two years ago, was any direct connection between any one of these single causes and the level of stress in a particular person. So we tried, what we did, they did, used 10 or 20 of the questions from the uh, wheel and uh, Rosen wheel uh, questionnaire. And they created 20 of their own. Now, it may have been that the 20 that they created didn't really draw out the things that we're trying to measure because designing questionnaires is kind of complicated and difficult. Or it may have been that the stress testing uh, questions from Rosen Wheel are no longer valid. We really don't know quite what's going on there. We couldn't find any direct link, but we could measure that stress levels have increased, that people do find uh, all of these things collectively to cause a bit of a problem for, for, for each of us. Um, so, tech stress is there, it's there in different parts of the population at very, very high levels and maybe lesser levels. We haven't done the, I haven't done the full statistics of it because I haven't really got access to good sets of data to the way that, they, that the data was extracted from the various um, survey forms and so on is not adequate for me to adjust to hoover up the whole lot and aggregate possibly two, two and a half thousand sets of responses, um, which is a bit of a pity because it would be interesting to do some of the SAS complicated statistics to, to look at the clusterings. But, uh, so we know that it's increased, we, don't, we have a fairly good feel for why or the overall sets of causes which are causing stress, whether it's workload overload, email overload, all these other things, the irritation factor that you know, someone you're talking to is still busy listening to you, we hope, we don't know for sure, but they're busy texting and they're reading their messages, and we haven't a clue whether our, there's a conversation there or not, except for the odd, mm, yeah, mm, yeah, yeah, mm. There's lots of things going on. And it's all, as well, as like we saw with the um, TED talk just now, there's all sorts of things that we are leaking, letting leak out, we are irritated by, and if you think about what's going on, uh, there's a lot of, sort of schizophrenia happening in a sense, or split personality. We want, our, we want to use these things like Facebook, uh, like Twitter, and yet when it turns around and someone uses that against us, oh, I saw that photo of you after you'd had a very happy time that you posted on Facebook and we're not interested now in employing you any longer or thinking about looking at your application because <laughs> we don't want that sort of person. You know, you, you don't mind sharing it with your friends, but when that's picked up, maybe because your security settings are a little bit lax or something and a potential employer uses that against you, that's not fair. Or and I've heard this in, the, in one of those lifts, not in this year, but last year I think it was. Somebody was busy in the, in the lift, I mean the lifter was nearly full, so it's all kind of like that. And there was someone talking on their phone to a friend about what had happened in their love life last night. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think we all want to listen to... And, but, and, and I know that if, I, if any of us says, had said as we got out of the lift, that person, really, you had that fantastic evening last night. What are you doing listening to my conversation? You can't listen to my conversation when I'm in the lift. What? Hang on. You're talking nearly at the top of your voice and you expect us to go, what, what? Think about the consequences. And you, you're on the train or on the bus. I mean, Dennis and I every now and then go down to London or something for a conference or what have you. 
And often in the evening, you hear, if you're not in a quiet carriage, you hear all these conversations going on. I remember once when I was um, teaching down in Southern Africa, just going out to the aircraft in the, the buses that they shot with you around in Joburg Airport. And there were two guys just over there, and they were having what should have been a seriously confidential business talk about what they're going to do in Botswana when they got there. I mean, this was serious. High, I mean, if I, if I had been wanted to do something with that was could have been an opportunity for high grade industrial espionage because they were just talking about things which they really shouldn't have been talking about. It should have been kept business confidential. Wait till you get to your hotel guys. <coughs> Don't talk about it in the middle of the bus. <coughs> and it's all of these things that are going on that are uh, how we're using social media, how we're using social networks, how we're changing our attitudes to privacy, and again, in a completely bimodal way. I want my privacy when I want it, and I want to give away my privacy when I want to give it away. And the tools available, as you said on the talk, are not terribly effective at the moment. And then you have to think about what's going to happen over the next few months or years as ad blockers become more and more powerful, uh, and so on. Will that change the business models of the social network, uh, social media networks? Will they start having to charge, or will they find another way, or will they become even more intrusive so they can sell more powerful adver adverts that get to us even when we don't want to have them, reinforcing our blindness? So all sorts of things like that that come into play about stress, techno stress. Um, social media, the intrusions into privacy, and so on and so, so forth. So, those are the sort of things that I think are kind of interesting. And you know, as we move through into our new projects this year, I think we're going to find out other things which may be related to this because we're now starting to find, for example, that apps on Android and iOS apps can be quite leaky about our personal details. <coughs> and there was a report only the last couple of days or so. Uh, about some what research work done by some students at the university recently looked at how much data, whether it's user, uh, usernames, or email addresses, or location, were actually being leaked unnecessarily to lots of other um, websites and so on for absolutely no apparently good reason. Some of the apps, only two or three other uh, URLs would be communicated with. One, the worst one connected to about 19 or 20 different leaving cookies behind which ends up were read by other uh, websites and so on. It's, we're now getting so much leakiness which perhaps breaks our um, U European and UK data protection regime as well just for, as an interesting side point. So I think we're going to see lots of interesting things happening. Might address some of this techno stress problems, might address the invasions of privacy. Who knows? Okay. Do you want to leave this running? No, it's just. Right, because I didn't think what Richard's been talking about.